Let me read to you a passage from the ninth chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 18 to 24. It's the Gospel for the twelfth Sunday of Ordinary Time, Year C. St. Luke writes, Once when Jesus was praying in private, and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, the Christ of God. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. That's from Luke chapter 9, verse 18 to 24. It suggests thoughts about happiness. What do I mean? Well, there are many things which strike the observer about the world, its richness, its vastness, its order, its beauty. What is especially striking is its constant activity and change. The universe is a cauldron of change and activity, from the smallest neutron to the most gifted human being, up to the galaxies which man is ever discovering. It seems that nothing stops. Nothing is basically still, whatever be the appearances. If in life we find that we have simply stopped, on further inspection we notice that we are probably deteriorating. For simply to stop is generally to stagnate. We are made to be in action, as are all things. That is not to say that activity and change is synonymous, synonymous with development and growth. Still, change and activity is a fundamental feature of the universe. Man himself is ever changing and in action for good or for bad. Now, if we were to ask what drives this activity and change, we could say it is, broadly speaking, the quest for happiness or fulfilment. All things desire their happiness, understood as, in some sense, the fulfilment of their needs. Non-intelligent and non-reflective beings are not aware of this hidden purpose of their change and action, but man certainly is or is able to be. He wants to be happy. He knows this, and he consciously seeks it. The challenge for him is that his needs and his aspirations are far deeper, far more exalted than those of the world around him, whether he realises this or not. So it is imperative that he know what he really needs and what are his greatest aspirations, which must be met if he is to attain his true happiness as a man. On this, he finds by experience that he can be tragically mistaken. He must also grasp how his various other needs and aspirations must assist him in the attainment of his true end, which is to say his highest needs. The most natural thing in the world is to think that happiness is to be attained in material or temporal satisfaction. To a point, of course, it is. God means us to satisfy our material needs, to a point, that is, and in a way that is in accord with his will and law. Indeed, we see in the Old Testament that when God establishes his covenant with his chosen people, he promises that if they are faithful to it, he will bless them. By and large, the blessings promised in the Old Testament are of a temporal character. They will be freed of oppressive slavery. They will enter and enjoy the promised land. 
They will be protected from the invading army. Their crops will be successful. If they are not faithful, these temporal blessings will be lost to them. At times there are promises not of mere temporal blessings, but of blessings hereafter, such as the promise of heaven held out by the mother of the seven sons who are about to be martyred, as we read in the second book of Maccabees chapter 7. The Messiah who was coming would bring to fruition God's promises for man, and these were generally understood to consist of a material and temporal utopia. But in the event, when he came, he revealed that this was not so. All of this brings us to our Gospel today from Luke chapter 9, verse 18 to 24, in which our Lord reveals that he, the promised Messiah, was destined not for temporal blessings, but for a terrible death. Glory would come, but through the embrace not of temporal satisfaction, but of obedient suffering unto death. Indescribable suffering in union with the will of the Father was the doorway to glory. Further, those who aspired to accompany the Messiah and share his blessings must follow the same path. As we read, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. This was a revolutionary revelation and an occasion for his rejection. The inestimable blessing, the one for which man was made, the one which brings to him his true and ultimate happiness, the one for which he ought pray very assiduously, the one which all his other desires and needs should subserve, the pearl of great price for which he ought to sell all to gain, is that of close friendship with Jesus Christ, in the way Christ intends. This means the cross, its acceptance when it comes, and its embrace for love of Christ. The cross is all the suffering entailed in doing the will of God each day to the end, as Christ and his church teach it to be. Let us understand this clearly, and pray for the grace to grasp it, for our ultimate happiness is at stake.